Hi, how you doing? Um, obviously I'm back out of the gym, so the sound quality is not brilliant, but I hope you'll forgive me. In this video, what I want to do is reply to a video that a number of you have suggested that I take a look at, and that's the, the Fighting Irish stance video that was released by Fighting Tips, filmed by Shane. Um, so this is a direct response to that video. Firstly, Shane, thank you very much for making the video. It's really nice to see somebody from the mainstream of fighting with as many followers as you talking about classical pugilism. So for that, I'm really very grateful. There are a few things that I'm, I'm not convinced that you, 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 you got quite right, um, and that's what I'm going to focus on in this. Um, please don't think just because I'm focusing on the negative things, I dislike the video. I, I'm really glad that you made it. Um, the first and most obvious thing is, is the actual stance itself that we're talking about. And you describe this stance as we see on the Notre Dame logo, the, the classical Irish leprechaun, in this, this sort of rear inclined, that one arm across the stomach, one hand out here. And that's, that's a very typical stance of the time. Um, but what we need to bear in mind is that when we're talking about the bare knuckle era, when we're talking about pugilism, classical pugilism, so pre Marquess of Queensbury, we can divide it into three specific eras. And this is really important, we're going to talk about this a few times. Effectively, we've got the era where there were no rules at all, we've got the era where Broughton's rules were in place, and then we've got the London Prize Ring. Um, what we're looking at predominantly for this is the, the later rule sets. You see this stance in, in a lot of the later, more transitional era. People like Donnelly, Allen, and Whitney's a very similar stance. But also, when we go further back in time to the days of people like Mendoza and Broughton and Jackson and, and Tom Johnson, we see this stance there. And thankfully, what we've got are some, some really clear, both images from, of the fighters from the time, but also descriptions of how these fighters fought. Um, there's one book called Boxing Reviewed by Thomas Futrell, who was both a writer and a fighter. He was never champion of all England, but he was a contemporary and friend of Daniel Mendoza, among other people. And he describes the three main stances that were in use at the time. And the first is pretty much exactly as you've described, as is seen on the, the Notre Dame logo, this fighting Irish, with all the white on the rear leg, backwards inclined, the rear hand across the, the pit of the stomach, the left hand inclined out. The hands are palm upwards. That's just the way it was done. And that's much more so through as we get later in the system. We'll see people like Ned Donnelly, who was teaching across that transitional period, actually throwing punches out in a completely supernated degree. But this was how Richard Humphreys fought. Now, we don't know much about Richard Humphreys these days. People don't talk about him. Again, he never won the championship, but he was effectively Daniel Mendoza's main rival. He was considered one of the most aesthetically pleasing boxers to watch, one of the most scientific fighters of the era. And this was how he fought. Very linear stance, weight back, covering the mark, hand out. And that's, that's the stance that, obviously, this logo is based heavily on. But that's not the only one. We've got Mendoza's stance, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about that because I did a video specifically on Mendoza's stance uh, a little while ago. But his weight, what ten he did tend to do, instead of having his weight on his back leg and leaning backwards, he tend to lean forwards and put his weight more on his front leg. And this rear hand would be brought forward significantly. So they're not quite level, but it's not all the way back as we see in, in Humphreys. So he was fighting here, and again, he would bring his palms facing his face. So that's, that was Mendoza's stance. And what that allowed him to do, because he was quite a small man, is it allowed him A, to keep his elbows tucked in, and B, to throw his head back to aid slipping or evading any punches. The third stance, and it's worth mentioning though it's, it's completely off the wall and not really related to, to the Notre Dame logo, was that used by a fighter called Tom Johnson, who was champion, and was renowned as a fantastic fighter. And he had, at the time, what people described as the best balance between offense and defense. And what he tended to do was to bring his legs a lot more straight and crouch down a little and bring his hands out together. And this is how he was standing. 
Um, for the record, what I've done is I've printed out a PDF of a book on boxing written in the 1700s. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. That's a picture of Tom Johnson in his stance. Um, so we've got a few different ways that people were standing. But there are a couple of other things in, in the video that I'd like to address as well before I go. The first is that you say grappling wasn't allowed. Um, and, and sadly, that's not true. Grappling was very much allowed. Um, throughout all three eras of the bare knuckle period, grappling was an integral and important part of fighting. In the pre-Broughton Drills era, this early era, there were no rules at all. Anything went. Fighters would agree beforehand how they would fight and which things were allowed and which things weren't. But throwing, grappling, ground fighting, elbow strikes, biting, gouging, all of these things were technically acceptable. The goal was to win the fight. Um, and it's this, this era that, that was very much connected to the American system of rough and tumble. Um, for another video. The second era, Broughton's Rules era, actually took away some of those things, but it didn't take away the ability to grapple. All it did was took away ground fighting. Once you or your opponent touched the ground, anything from the knee upwards hits the ground, the round is over, and you stop fighting, and you have a 30 second break. So he effectively introduced the concept of rules. Again, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail because I've done a video all about Broughton. Um, and we talked through his rule set there, but he did not very specifically rule out grappling. And that wasn't ruled out even in the London Prize Ring or the revised London Prize Ring rules. It wasn't until the Marquess of Queensbury's rule set was introduced that grappling was effectively removed. Um, if this is of interest to you or anybody watching, I strongly recommend you get hold of a copy of a book called Banned from Boxing by a friend of mine, a guy called Kurt Lawson. Um, Kirk is a long-time researcher and practitioner of classical pugilism. In fact, it was him that coined the phrase classical pugilism. Um, he's a great guy, it's a very good book. What he's done is he's searched through all the manuals he can find from the bare knuckle era and brought together all the grappling and all the throws uh, so you can see them in their different forms and how they were done by different people. Uh, it's a fascinating book, it's available from Lulu, but if you Google it, you'll, you'll be able to find it. It's banned from boxing. So, grappling was very much an integral part of boxing, and that's one of the main reasons that we see this supinated palms towards the face guard. We don't see like, the hands out because if that changes the plane in which the arm bends. If you're fighting with your palm towards yourself, your elbow bends in this vertical plane. And what that means is you're able to tuck your elbows right in and it's much harder to grapple against somebody that's doing that. If you're fighting with your hands rotated round more, your elbows tend to bend in a more horizontal plane. And the same is true when you're throwing round blows, that that arm is now bending in that horizontal plane. And that's one of the reasons that Every single text that we see from the bare knuckle period tells us that round blows are not to be used. Straight blows are to be used. Let me find you a little quote. This is written in 1790 by Thomas Futrell. Uh, Straight blows are preferable to all others. They are stronger because they come directly from the centre of power. Blah, 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 blah. Round striking is now universally exploded. Um, that's just from one book. There are lots of books saying very similar things. Round blows were not used. Very short contracted arm strikes were used by some people. And all of the sources tell you how to defend against round blows, but none of them tell you to use them until you get to this transitional era. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is this idea that bare knuckle boxers from the classical pugilism era used palm strikes instead of punches. And again, that's sadly, it's just not true. That's not the case. Um, palm strikes can be immensely effective. Um, the stuff that Baz Rotten is showing is just brilliant. Baz is a monster. He's absolutely fantastic. I'm a huge fan. Um, and and he, he demonstrates these strikes, and they are great. But they're not what was being used. We know this because we're told this by the people that were there doing it. 
Um, going back to this book from the, uh, the 1700s, um, and this is only one of many. Uh, here we go, when we're talking about uh, a proper knowledge of striking should be the first attainment, the different kinds of blows, uh, the large knuckles of the hand should be only used, they are rarely disabled, but the knuckles in the middle of the fingers frequently give way. What he's saying there is that when you throw this strike, what we're aiming to do is contact with these knuckles here. What we're not doing is throwing this as a, as a power strike. What we're not trying to do is hit with these knuckles here. We're trying to make sure we only hit with the metacarpophalangeal joints the large knuckles of the hand. Some of the later systems, when we look at, say, Allison Wynn and Donnelly, all the way through to um, championship fighting by Dempsey, we see this idea of a vertical strike punch. Um, and that's how people were striking. They were throwing out straight punches, relatively simple, they'd use this falling step or this lead off to throw this strike punch. And palm strikes tended not to be used. There's, there's a myth that goes around within classical pugilism and historical European martial arts that the, the chopper, these, these chopper bars were done as a hammer fist. And again, we know that's not true. If we go back and we look at the texts of the time, we've got accurate depictions of exactly how this was done. And it tended to be done off the back of a block people would throw up an elbow to block and, and use that to almost attack the arm as, as a strike was coming in and off the back of that they'd roll around with the chopper and again it's described as using these knuckles to try and contact so whether we're throwing a straight punch whether we're throwing a contracted arm strike or whether we're throwing a chopper we're still trying to contact with these knuckles these big MCP joints so I hope this has been of some interest to you. I, I, I hope that, that um, I haven't offended you. That's not my intention at all. As I said at the beginning, I really, really love the video and I love that you're looking at this stuff. There are, there are some great things out there. Jack Slack, uh, the modern writer, wrote a fantastic comparison of Daniel Mendoza and Nick Diaz on bloodyelbow.com. Yeah, Google it. Brilliant article. Very well written. Um, there are all sorts of other articles like that out there, and we're beginning to see some of these classical pugilism techniques creep back into MMA now. Um, now, I, before I go, I accept 100% that I don't have all the answers. It may well be that what you've got is some source material that I have not yet seen. If you've got this material, please let me see it, because all the material I've found points to the fact that these palm strikes weren't used. If you've got something that says that's how people was, were, were fighting back there, please, I'd love to see it. I really would. Um, drop me an email, uh, martin at englishmartialarts.com. And um, yeah, if at any point, Shane, this is directly to you, mate, if at any point you'd like to do some sort of collaboration where we're looking at comparing some of the historical methods of fighting with some of the more modern methods of fighting and looking at how one's evolved into the other, give me a shout. That's something I'd really love to do. Uh, anyway, I won't take up any more of your time. Uh, keep up the good work, and I'll see you around. Take care.